Welcome to the committee, uh, the Taxes Committee, April 18th, 2024. First item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from April 17th, 2024. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, they are adopted. The first item on our agenda is Senate File 4431, Senator Rust. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for presenting this bill on behalf of um, Senator Westland. And I didn't want to start out on um, a bad note, but um, uh, we do not have the uh, correct engrossment of this bill. Um, we should have the second engrossment, not the, um, and what we have is the first engrossment. Um, nevertheless, while we are obtaining that, um, <clears throat> I would like to, um, so we will wait um, until either members can bring it up on their computers or we can get some, um, some comp copies. But what I would like to do as that's happening is to go through the, um, <clears throat> uh, the um, uh, summary of it, which is to the second engrossment. Okay. So we will um, soon have the uh, second engrossment either brought up on your computers or, um, or in paper. Um, the, um, um, some of those of us in the legislature who have um, been interested over many years for ways of um, processing um, political contributions to, um, uh, to campaigns uh, to make it smoother, to make it more electronic, um, insofar as possible, to um, avoid using paper uh, unless it is the uh, desire of the person who is contributing to a, a campaign. And um, this year, or last year, we increased the political contribution refund by 50% to um, $75 for an individual uh, contributor um, and, um, and 150 for, um, uh, for Minnesota residents um, <clears throat> for uh, um, a, married, uh, a married couple. So what 4431 does is to establish an electronic filing system um, for in doing exactly that. Um, it eliminates the, the, that current paper filing system and um, but, but because, um, as I recall in the testimony, um, because the vast majority of, um, of um, contributors, usually of low amounts, um, are, are uh, um, people who are uh, older, um, who don't, um, who maybe don't have um, everyday access to a um, a computer, but they are the vast majority of the contributors of small of small contributions, and are um, more likely to uh, want the paper, uh, the paper. Uh, PCR receipt and to file a paper copy with with the um, an application with the uh, Department of Revenue. Um, one of the things that we want to always be careful with in this day of um, certainly of artificial intelligence invading almost every aspect of our lives, although I've had a hard time getting a lot of interest in how it works would work in the Senate. Nevertheless, it's there and it's there all the time. So data privacy is very, is very important in a system um, like this. And uh, section one um, allows, and there has to be, there has to be a method for um, secure and reliable for uh, the campaign finance board, um, who is uh, here in the presence of, uh, in the person of of um, Mr. Sigurdsson and the Department of Revenue and the person of uh, Joanna Bears to, um, 
connect and talk, um, share information that is only related to the PCR um, it, to meet the goal of security and reliability and to make sure that um, the data is that would be shared is um, is properly uh, is properly done with regard to public data, uh, which it is not, um, but private data, and then and also non-public data. And each of those, as I'm sure you know, has a um, going the other way around has a greater de greater degree of, of security. Um, public data to non-public data to um, to private data. So uh, <clears throat> uh, section one deals with that. Section two, two allows for the an electric uh, electronic fund receipts and and replaces um, in the main those those paper uh, receipts. Um, the um, in section three. The refund of, uh, deals with the refunds of contributions to political parties and candidates, and um, uh, and that is um, uh, and that is the substance of the um, of the bill. It also allows, as you know, you know, right now, um, um, when you file, you're asked to at least. Or, you know, when you file for a um, a refund, um, you wait until you have receipts that it, that equal at least the the maximum amount that you can uh, claim, um, and file it only once a year. With an electronic system, you don't have to worry so much about paper and postage and and mail delivery and and so forth so that uh, you can file multiple times a year as long as it does not exceed the, um, the maximum refund. So um, the, minimum, the minimum, however, and there's a real important reason for that in my mind, um, is, is $10. So you can, if, you have, if you have spent um, $75 on a, um, on a candidate, for example, you could, and they were in ten dollar, and then one fifteen dollar um, uh, uh, contribution. You could um, you could make multiple filings um, uh, during the year, and um, um, the the neg there's a negligible cost to the uh, to the state, um, and um, <clears throat> that. It, um, uh, because it comes <clears throat> comes in front of the Judiciary Committee as well as the, the um, <clears throat> Tax Committee, it is a it is a work in um, in progress. Um, so I would like to um, I think I think here comes the bill. Um, so as you receive those, Mr. Chairman. I would offer as a author's amendment um, the A-12, which is drawn to the second engrossment. Senator Rest offers the A-12. Um, and Senator Rest, just so you're aware, the chief author is in the room now at this point. So if you are interested in swapping out at any time, you certainly could. Um, would you like to describe the A-12, or should I have counsel do that? Uh, um, I see what you mean. She's here. Yes. Okay, fine. <laughs> no, no, I, um, no, you're the chief author, and it, it's the first stop, and so you need to be here. Otherwise, it's not an author's amendment. Okay. I'm perfectly okay with you for a
there will be a substitution. <laughs> so we haven't talked about either amendment yet. Correct, but I think 12 now. Hey, um, Senator Westland, uh, we have already had a description of the procedures and the provisions. We're now ready to adopt the uh, author's amendments. Um, Senator uh, Klein offers the which one is it? the A12 amendment. On Senator Westland's behalf, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> please say no. Uh, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There is another author's amendment, and I left them at the witness desk, so I need to know what they are. There's the 813 amendment. Senator Klein, <laughs> on Senator Westland's behalf, um, offers the 813. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. The uh, motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Um, Senator Wesselin, I believe at this point, actually, we're ready to hear from your testifiers. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I do want to thank you um, for presenting the bill this morning and offering the committee the background. I know that you have actually worked on PCR for many, many years, and so it's been wonderful to have you as my co-author, and thank you so much for that presentation. Yeah, happy and, to do it. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we have um, Ms. Bears, as I mentioned, in the presentation present, and, um, uh, and Mr. Um, Sigurdsson. I don't see the list of those. We don't have you on the witness list, but we're going to call on you anyway. Um, uh, Mr. Sigurdsson, why don't you um, uh, tell us about the uh, Campaign Finance Board's involvement in this process. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Jeff Sigurdsson of the Campaign Finance Board. The uh, board in many ways has the easier part of the task here that uh, is being accomplished by this legislation. We already have the online application which allows treasurers and candidates to generate a, uh, a paper PCR receipt for any contribution entered into the system. And if your PC has a uh, appropriate PDF driver, you can also generate a, a PDF of that uh, receipt, which can be then emailed if you have the donor's emails to try to compress the, the process, um, but also provide the donor with the information that they need to then go to the, uh, the site that would be developed by the Department of Revenue, in which they can simply enter in the, uh, the contribution uh, PCR number, and at that point, then they'll be able to process it online uh, with also the option of mailing that in if, if that's their, their approved approach. Uh, the modifications that you see to Chapter 10A is, is required because the information that is entered into the uh, online reporting system is all encrypted, and the board only has ac access to that information currently when you generate and file a report with the board. We can't see the data that you've entered into the system. This allows also basically for another type of report, which is the file that we'll be sending on a weekly basis or perhaps more often than that to the Department of Revenue that has the information on the uh, PCR donations that have been issued for the prior week. Thank you very much. Ms. Bears, would you like to describe the department's role um, in this proposed system? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Joanna Bears. I'm the Legislative Director at the Minnesota Department of Revenue. And I'd like to say, actually, we think we have an easier part. Uh, we're really good at giving refunds. <laughs> and so our process will be is building an electronic system. The uh, folks will be able to go into our e-services. They'll be able to file their PCR claim, and we'll be able to shoot out a refund, uh, either via paper check or uh, U.S. debit. Uh, folks will still have the opportunity to file a oh, a paper claim with the department. So if they choose not to do an electronic process, uh, they could still do the paper ballot as well. Um, thank you, Ms. Bears. Um, members will note that the, um, uh, that the uh, lines, <clears throat> um, section four appropriations, there's a blank. Um, we will work with the department 
um, to um, make an appropriate an appropriate appropriation there when the bill goes into the um, um, omnibus bill. Uh, <clears throat> Senator Westland, uh, final comments. Um, Madam Chair, I will just say that I, I think the public subsidy program is such an excellent program and it, it provides the opportunity um, for uh, individuals to make smaller donations, to have their voices heard in our elections, and then to receive a refund. It's been a really important part of our election system and what this does is it brings us into the 21st century to actually make it easier for those who make donations to our campaigns to get those refunds in a more efficient uh, way while also preserving a paper option for those who choose. And so it's just been uh, my pleasure to, um, again, to partner with you and with Senator Coran on this and uh, uh, hope that uh, this, this committee feels that this is a worthy uh, endeavor as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, and now, well, I should have known, Senator Draskowski, even though she has made her final comments, unlike on the floor, you may speak now. Well, ma <laughs> well Madam Chair, I was just, uh, I was just trying to kind of work around the, the, uh, the um, lack of opportunity earlier to do this. Okay. So, um, just, just one quick question. Thank you, Senator Westland, for the bill. It looks like a good bill. Um, I'm just curious, and maybe this is for Mr. Sigurdsson and Ms. Bears, I don't know. Um, as we make this more available and easier to do, uh, it, it um, prompts me to, to question and ask how this affects, or maybe it doesn't affect, the really the enforcement of the eligibility for the PCR to begin with, to make certain that the person is, as I remember, if I remember correctly, eligible to vote in our election in November of that year or whatever that, that language is. Can you just review for us quickly, I don't want to take a lot of time, but just quickly how that happens, that eligibility is verified with the person and is there any interaction with this new system that will affect that? Ms. Beers. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Jaskowski, uh, when, you, when a candidate files a PCR claim or files for a contribution, they'll get a unique identification number that will then get submitted to the Department of Revenue. So when the, the person who donated the funds goes and applies with the department, they'll have that unique identification number and we will be able to match it up for verification purposes. Uh, to your questions about whether the eligibility of voting, I don't know if uh, Mr. Segerson could answer that question or not. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Draskowski, I think it comes in two parts. On the uh, online system, you do have to enter in the address of the contributor for this to work. Um, and that would then, it, it flags, the default is that it's looking for a Minnesota address. Now you can override that because uh, there is the possibility of someone having military service or, or for whatever reason being out of the state but still being a Minnesota resident. So, but so there is the opportunity for a treasurer to affirm that, the, that they've identified that the individual is uh, eligible um, for the refund because they are a Minnesota resident, even if they're temporarily out of the state. But in general, you have to provide the, the Minnesota address, which is then provided to the Department of Revenue. Um, I, and then I'm not sure if the Department of Revenue looks at a Social Security number or if there's something else that you look at, but that would be the other element that I'm Senator Driskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sigurdsson and Ms. Bears. So I, I still don't see or understand how, does, doesn't the law say they have to be eligible to vote? So how do we ensure that somebody who is not eligible to vote that is living in Minnesota at a Minnesota address is not accessing this, this contribution refund? For, for any refund, is there, is there a check on that? Or? Uh, Mr. Madam Secretary. Chair, uh, Senator Truskowski, I, I think there is the affirmation that is, is made at, at that time by the treasurer or the candidate that, they, uh, that the age, for example, in the, in the CFRO program, you do not enter the age of the, of the donor. So in terms of are they 18 years of age or older, that would be a question that we should be asked uh, by the committee that's receiving the donation as to whether or not they're old enough to, to vote in the state. Um, beyond that, uh, there isn't, uh, through, the, through the 
Campaign Finance Board, there isn't a process where we take that address and then compare it to some list to see if, in fact, the individual is eligible to vote. That's, that's true. That doesn't occur in our end. Madam Chair. And just, and that, thank you, Madam Chair. And that's the way it currently is. I mean, basically every time makes, someone makes a donation, there are certain affirmations that they're making. And from a practical standpoint, right now just doing the paper, we're confirming they're a Minnesota resident. Um, they are affirming that they're of a certain age, but we actually aren't otherwise confirming it. All this is doing, so all this is doing is streamlining the process. So instead of issuing a paper receipt to somebody, they would have the option of doing it online. Um, <clears throat> Senator Draskowski, I would point out in terms of the language of the, of the bill, it really is directing the Department of Revenue to come up with a system. And I think um, that they are going to be, um, because we're going to check on it, <laughs> that they're going to be um, very alert to um, uh, uh, opportunities of mischief that aren't already available to uh, people that make uh, contributions, either that are underage, um, who are 16-year-olds, um, or people that don't live in Minnesota, um, as well as being, I don't think you have to be a voter, you have to be eligible to be uh, a voter. That, that's what you're attesting to. And Madam Chair, just one other additional item. Um, the the Department of, I'm sorry, thank you, it's Madam okay. Chair. Um, on the Department of Revenue on their side actually can confirm their age and so on. And so okay. there are yeah. confirmations okay. on that. So end. there are already some, some protections in, in place. Yeah. Any I, other uh, questions or comments? So, so Madam Chair. Senator Drzewski. Uh, thank you, and, and I, I do think it's worth us collectively trying to figure that out. Um, I, I, as, as we make this more available and accessible to people, it may be used more and it's easier for them to access. I think we need to make sure that the eligibility part is followed through. And, and again, I, Senator Wessel and I agree, it's no different than what we're doing now with the paper, but it just prompted me to think what it is that we're doing to make certain that if someone is, is going to get this contribution refund that they indeed do qualify according to the law. Um, so I, I hope that discussion happens with the department prompted by this bill. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Senator. Senator, are there further comments or questions of Senator Westland or the witnesses? Um, seeing none, Senate File 4431 as amended. It's laid over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next bill um, is uh, Senator Grunhagen. <clears throat> Senate File 5325 uh, regarding an LGA um, <clears throat> uh, penalty forgiveness for the city of um, Stewart. Welcome to the committee, um, uh, Senator. Uh, oh, thank you, Madam Brunigan, Chair. Again, if you would like to explain the circumstances sure. that the um, penalty uh, occurred under which. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members, for hearing this bill, Senate File 5325. It has to do with some uh, mix-up on paperwork for filing for L LG for 2023. This is a small community, uh, Stewart, Minnesota, in my district, and uh, in western McLeod County, and their population's between 450 and about 500 people. It, fl it fluctuates. And they had some change over there, and I did bring a testifier along. Uh, Mr. Nathan from the League of Minnesota Cities to explain further. Um, uh, I think you've explained it quite well, Senator <laughs> Kernhagen. Um, uh, this is a, a paperwork um, error as well as a timing error, and the, the uh, state auditor is required to uh, deny the LGA uh, uh, unless yep. it is forgiven by the legislature, and that's what you're here to ask for. There is no there is no uh, revenue estimate, by the way, because if this is paid by J June 1st of 2024, uh, it is an assumed payment already done in the forecast, and uh, we do not, we have to carry the language, but we don't have to carry any, uh, uh, any hit on the, 
uh, on yeah, the Madam, state treasury. Senator Grunin. Yeah, Madam Chair, uh, Nathan does have some additional information, which I think the committee would find interesting on why there was a mix-up, if you give them just a minute or so. Mr. Jessen, welcome to the committee. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Nathan Jessen. I represent the League of Minnesota Cities. As Senator uh, Grunhagen mentioned, this is a case of the city of Stewart being between city clerks uh, when, when the reporting uh, documents were due. They're now back in compliance with OSA requirements. Um, as Senator Rest mentioned, there's not a general fund uh, cost because uh, the, uh, this doesn't cancel back to the general fund until June 30th. And just as a matter of background, uh, 40 cities actually missed their initial, uh, their, uh, the initial deadline to receive their first half payment. The league worked with small cities and the Office of the State Auditor to really try to make sure that number is as small as possible. And this is the only uh, penalty forgiveness bill that's been introduced this year. Thank you, Mr. Jessen. Are there any uh, questions or comments for Senator Grunhagen or Mr. Jessen? Seeing none, thank you very much. And Senate file 5325 will be laid over. The next thank you. item. The next bill on our agenda is Senate file 5334, Senator Putnam. And in this presentation, we have one um, testifier on, on Zoom when we get to it. Um, Senator um, Putnam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and with your indulgence, as is the convention of this committee, I would like to spend the next perhaps hour going through the actual details of the changes we would in this enjoy bill. Enjoy that no end. And uh, we call uh, so it I'll being start. A smart aleck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> But so, so, Madam Chair, the, the, the first change that I'd like to note is on line 1.10, which is the removal of the word primarily. Oops, now I'm done. Uh, that is the totality of the bill, Madam Chair, uh, and now I'll explain its uh, significance or why it's a good idea. Um, the current law includes a longstanding sales tax exemption for the machinery and equipment uh, primarily used to provide telecommunication or pay television services. Uh, but in today's competitive communications marketplace, communication service providers are increasingly using their networks to provide not only telecommunications and pay TV, but also broadband service. So the same materials that they were using are now having multiple purposes. And the same equipment is used to provide all these services, and the use of the primarily is out of date relative to contemporary technology. So the statutory requirement that the equipment be used primarily to provide telecommunication services or pay television services is problematic because broadband providers offer multiple services over the same networks using the same technology. Uh, and uh, given that this is a little bit technical, even though the bill itself is quite simple, at that point I can turn to our testifiers to answer any questions about the sure. technology itself. <clears throat> um, Senator Putnam, the, what is not technical is the revenue estimate, unfortunately. Sure. Um, <clears throat> um, welcome to the uh, committee. Um, Ms. Pisick. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Senator Putnam and Chair Rust. I'm Sarah Pisick. I'm here representing CTIA, which is the Trade Association for the Wireless Industry. And I am going to actually just turn it over to Scott Mackey, who is online. I just, in case there were any technical problems, wanted to be available. So, uh, Welcome to the committee. Um, Mr. Mackey, we're pleased to have your testimony. Um, if you would identify yourself, please, for the record. Thank you, Senator Rest and committee members. My name is Scott Mackey uh, with Leonine Public Affairs in Montpelier, Vermont, and I'm here today testifying on behalf of the, the wireless companies that have networks in Minnesota, so AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon, as well as CTIA, the Trade Association for the entire industry. So the senator really laid out the bill. As he mentioned, there's not a lot to it. Um, and he laid out some of the rationale. I'll just So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I'll briefly reiterate a couple of the points that he made. Um, you know, Minnesota has had a longstanding exemption for telecommunications and cable company machinery and equipment that's used to provide a variety of ser services to Minnesota residents. This is a, you know, it's a business input, and Minnesota has long recognized that it's not a good idea to tax that business input. Um, but as the senator mentioned, the, the industry has changed significantly since enactment of this uh, exemption decades ago. And all of these networks are used to not only deliver sort of the services that they traditionally have 
of delivered cable television service, uh, wireless and wireline telecom. They're also now providing internet access, uh, social media applications that allow voice and video communications, uh, and as well as the traditional services. So because of that, it's becoming increasingly difficult for communications providers to determine whether the machinery and equipment used in this network is used primarily for telecom and pay TV services or for the newer types of communication services. And in fact, the answer to that question varies really on a customer by customer basis because consumers uh, uh, are purchasing such a wide variety of different services and all of the types of, of communications providers are all providing, uh, competing with each other and providing the same suite of services. So by removing the primarily requirement, this will clarify that all of this equipment, which has been exempt all along, will continue to be exempt even if other types of services are provided over those, provided over those networks. Um, this will ensure that every dollar invested in the networks is actually goes into the network instead of a, a sliver of it being used to pay uh, sales taxes on machinery and equipment. And I think it's particularly timely as millions of new dollars are flowing into the state uh, from the federal government under the broadband employment uh, programs that have been funded by Congress. This will make sure that every dollar goes into those networks and doesn't uh, get into a dispute about whether some of it should have been actually subject to sales tax. So let me conclude by just uh, saying, Senator Rest, Rest, that I appreciate your longstanding leadership uh, on your role of the uh, state as a member of the state and local uh, tax task force of the National Conference of State Legislatures. That organization has adopted policy that recommends that states do exactly what you've done for decades, which is exempt this equipment and modernize uh, these these exemptions to reflect the changing marketplace. So on behalf of CTIA and the companies I represent, uh, we respectfully request that the committee advance the bill. Uh, happy to answer any questions and again, appreciate the opportunity to testify and especially to be able to testify remotely. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Mackey. Um, and uh, he is indeed um, correct. A uh, longtime interest of mine um, in, in uh, NCSL's uh, uh, task force on sales tax for a long time. Now it's now it has gone to um, a broader interest of uh, uh, state and local taxes in uh, in general. We have one other. I have some questions, Senator. Um, Putnam, but we have one other uh, witness that I would like to hear from first. Mr. Christensen, if you'd identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Brent Christensen, and I'm the President and CEO of the Minnesota Telecom Alliance, or MTA. MTA is a mix of family-owned cooperatives, publicly held, privately traded uh, telecommunications providers throughout the state of Minnesota. Uh, I, I'm here to, to voice my overwhelming support for this bill. Uh, and thanks, Senator Putnam. This is actually his second attempt to, to fix an error that was, that was an oversight seven years ago. In 2017, the legislature expanded the, capital, the sales tax exemption on telecommunications equipment to include fiber and, and, and conduit. And we thought our job was done at that point. We thought everything was taken care of. We didn't realize that there was this... this uh, requirement in there that it had to be used primarily for telephone and television. Uh, and so it came to light for us a couple of years ago when uh, over the last three years, three of my members have had sales tax audits and that came to light as part of that process. Uh, one company, the Department of Revenue told them that as long as they used it for telephone and television, they didn't have to pay sales tax on the fiber and conduit. Another company, uh, they were told that they had to prorate the sales tax on that fiber and conduit uh, depending on how much of it was used for internet versus telephone or television. When we buy the fiber and conduit, we don't know how much of that traffic is going to be one or another. And nowadays, <laughs> telephone and television is, is transmitted over the internet. So it can be used for, it all is internet, but some of it can be used for telephone and some of it for television. 
a uh, third member this past summer. Uh, they were told that if they used the fiber and conduit, 51% for telephone and television, they didn't have to pay sales tax. If 51% of it was internet, they had to pay sales tax, and it was up to the company to prove that, and there's no way to prove that. So we've been working diligently with the Department of Revenue, uh, trying to define the, that definition, and this bill fixes that problem. And so I appreciate everything that the chair did last session to try and get the bill, Senator Putnam's bill across the finish line. We almost made it, and I'm hoping this year that we're gonna make it. And with that, I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Christensen. The, I'm curious about um, how this has been administered in the past by the, by the um, department. Um, over the next three years, this is a $10 million hit on the, um, uh, on the general fund, and if it was, um, if it had been administered previously um, and an exemption had been granted um, under an audit, you know, at an audit, um, why does just removing that one word, and I believe that Mr. Christensen addressed it in some, somewhat, but has this, this provision regularly been audited and, um, and the exemption been denied? Senator um, Putnam, do, um, do you have any more history um, of that to, that would explain why this is not a, um, uh, it's the addition of one word, but it is not a technical bill. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to defer to um, the experts on either side of me uh, okay. with a greater historical context of the application. Of the so bill. what has been the experience of Minnesota companies um, on audit is what I want to know. Sure. Um, Let's be sick. <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, we are seeing the same thing more recently. So this past year, a couple audits have been initiated on wireless companies as well as Mr. Christensen's companies. So we see it more of a going forward as the technology is changing, the department is um, doing more of these audits to try and determine what services are primarily being determined. And as Mr. Mackey said as well, it's the same equipment that has been exempt from sales tax, it's just now there's a different type of service or a broader type of service. So. We would argue we think that there should not really be a, a revenue hit because it's the same equipment that has been sales tax exempt for a number of years. Just people, technology and modernizing people are getting different service, some of the same services, but additional services through that same equipment. Um, Ms. Fiesek has um, an audit finding uh, resulted in litigation? Uh, Madam Chair, I'm not aware. Mr. Mackey may know or Mr. Christensen? In Minnesota. Madam Chair, I'm not aware of, of any litigation. Um, the companies have simply paid the penalty. So they've been, pay uh, there they've has, been paying there, it? Yes, ma'am. And there has okay. been a, a, uh, a couple appeals. Uh, one of them is still uh, in the in the hands of Commissioner Marquardt. And mm -hmm. I, I would just like to reiterate the Department of Revenue has been very good to work with. We've talked about the definition of the word primary. So for my members, we're required by the state and the federal government to provide telephone service. So my argument was that is a primary service, not necessarily what how much of that traffic is, is in there. Mm -hmm. And I, I would echo what Ms. Ms. Pasek said. Um, I don't I would argue that it's not a revenue hit. That's money that shouldn't have been collected in the first place. That was not the intent of the legislature in, in 2017. This was just something that um, just we stumbled upon by accident because of the sales tax audits. Thank you, Ms. PC. Um, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Mackey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just uh, on that point, um, I think it hasn't gotten to litigation because the issue is, is so new. Is it, as you know, it takes a while to work its way through the audits and appeals process. So I'm not aware of any litigation uh, at this point, again, because the issue is relatively new. Thank you, Mr. Mankey. Um, Senator Klein. Well, Madam Chair, Senator Putnam, uh, this is a true demonstration of the power of the Taxes Committee and power of language uh, that you've eliminated an adverb here, and it will 
impact state coffers by $4 million. You've discovered the $4 million adverb. Uh, <laughs> as a fellow lover of language, you were always our guy on appurtenances, which I thought was a $10 yeah, order. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but now you've got it for <laughs> I will always be your guy on appurtenances. <laughs> In any case, the $4 million adverb, Senator Putnam, is going to be uh, your uh, mantra going forward. And Senator Putnam, um, one of the um, challenges is um, uh, if this was a one-time exemption, uh, that would be um, that would be a different uh, policy, and our attitude would be different. Um, but this has uh, an ongoing tail that almost eats up our entire tails budget. So we're going to have to find some way of modifying that. Um, as this goes forward, and this is the kind of exemption because it does have tails that that's very difficult to uh, uh, to do with. But um, I think you can tell the committee is not unsympath unsympathetic to the change in policy. M Madam Chair, if I may, I completely understand the math problem here that we're dealing with. Um, uh, I would say that uh, I do think that there's the potential that this is not a problem that's going to go away. Um, that in fact it's likely to get more acute for our friends in the telecom biz as the years pass, as that ratio of, of people's usage of the same technology changes over time. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Ms. Pesek, Mr. Christensen, Mr. Mr. Mackey. Um, and Senate File 5334 is laid over. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next bill um, is Senator Housechild, Senate File 4007. <coughs> Senator House Charles. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Tax Committee. Today I have for your consideration Senate File 4007, a bill related to property taxes. This bill requires that the Commissioner of Revenue submit a study on potential reforms to the homeowner property tax refund system. The report must include recommendations to simplify the process for claiming property tax refunds currently available and improve participation in those refund programs. Last year's tax bill converted the renter's refund to a direct income tax credit. The department predicts that this change could impact approximately 120,000 renters who are currently eligible but do not collect the refund. This bill explores a similar conversion of the homeowner refunds currently available in order to increase participation and awareness of the programs. Thank you, Chair Rest and committee members for your consideration and happy to take questions. I have no testifiers. Um, <clears throat> Senator House Trial, I have a recommendation for um, the uh, date on line, um, on line 1.6. Um, January 15th is usually pretty quick date, um, and I wonder if you would move that to February 1st. Certainly, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to accept that as a friendly amendment if you would like. So Senator Housechild moves to lines 1.6 to strike um, January 15th, 2025, and insert February 1st, um, 2025. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The motion then prevails and the um, amendment is, um, is adopted. Um, anything further <coughs> on the study? Uh, Senator, Senator House Trump. I mean, Senator uh, Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have one question as far as the logistics involved with this program. Most people, at least in my area, don't receive their real estate tax statements, which is a, contains the necessary information for a property tax refund, until well into March. By that time, there are many tax returns already filed. So now you're creating a situation that requires an amended return, mm -hmm. additional costs, uh, and quite frankly, in light of how what the counties are required to do in terms of their timelines, I don't really see how we can, we can require them to get their notices out 
sooner than they do. How is this issue to be resolved, Sen Senator Housechild? Senator Housechild. Th thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Weber. Uh, it's a very interesting point you're making, and I certainly agree with you. Um, you know, I think the purpose of this bill is really to have a have a study done by the Department of Revenue to look into how do we increase uh, participation in this program. So I think the very issue you're bringing up should be one of the things that's that's looked into to how this can logistically work for people better. Yeah, I don't think um, <clears throat> Senator Weber and Senator Hellstrom. I don't. I don't think we're looking at making the property tax statements go out under a different schedule. I mean, I, I think that would be a uh, monumental task in terms of the gathering of all the information from the various taxing authorities to do it before, uh, to, to, before March. But um, we can see what they say. Senator, Senator Weber. Th th thank you, Madam Chair. And I agree, and, and I just, I just look at, uh, and I'm fine with the study, but I just look at some of the logistical problems up front, and, and I'm not quite sure, unless those can be dealt with, I am not sure what good a study will do us at the end of the day. Got it. Senator Housechild, anything else? No, Madam Chair, thank you for the consideration. Sure. Um, so Senate file 4007 um, is laid over. So, as amended. Um, the next bill is um, <coughs> Senate File 5435, um, Senator Hellstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Tax Committee. Uh, Madam Chair, what I thought I would do, if you're okay with it, is give some opening remarks, and then I do have an amendment that I can walk through, and then, of course, we can go to the underlying bill and do a summary of that. Um, thank you, um, Senator Hellstrom. Um, um, because it is a lengthy amendment. Uh, I mean, we can adopt it, but then if you would go back and then show how it is related to um, the bill. Um, <clears throat> so um, we have an author's amendment. We can start with that. Um, and it is the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Okay, Mr. Uh, Senator Hostile, if you would um, um, explain the bill, um, and um, you can incorporate in your explanation um, the effects of the amendment. And if members have any separate questions, we'll deal with them then. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, today I have for you the infamous mineral article for your consideration. And unlike in days of old, where this got slipped in at conference committee, I'm proud to present it uh, wide out in the open for the committee. Uh, the Iron Range is broken down into- It's a better target now. Do you understand that? <laughs> <laughs> I sure do, Madam Chair. Uh, the Iron Range is broken down into di two distinct areas. The Taconite Relief Area, which is a smaller portion of the Iron Range focused on the core regions where mining has and does exist. The other area is the larger taconite assistance area, which includes regions with a connection to the range and, and has opportunities to secure IRRRB grants through the agency. It's important to note that there are only two Senate districts in the state where mining is actually happening, and that's myself and Senator Farnsworth's district. This bill focuses on supporting the core iron range in the taconite relief area because I believe we should focus on those communities where mining is happening. Unfortunately, what we find is that these communities closest to mining ironically often face steeper economic challenges, which is why I believe our mining wealth should be reinvested back in those communities for critical projects, needs, and other uh, quality of life opportunities that our communities have asked for. It has been the tradition of the Iron Range legislators to try to big try big things to support their region. In years past, the legislator has passed large industrial project revenue bonds for projects like the LP mill in Two Harbors in 1991. In addition, starting in 2006, the range delegation took the historic step to utilize taconite proceeds to bond for schools. They did it again in 2013, and I did it again last year in the 2023 tax bill. However, what I continue to hear from local community members and leaders is that the investments are not making it back for the core needs in our local communities. 
That is why this bill invests in critical infrastructure, schools, and regional recreational opportunities that will increase the quality of life for our core Iron Range mining communities. In addition, we are focused on giving taconite proceeds directly back to the people by passing an increase in the taconite homestead credit to every homeowner in the taconite relief area. That's a 66% increase in property tax relief for Iron Range homeowners. Madam Chair, you will also be very happy, I'm sure, to know that this bill does not take a cent from the general fund and rather utilizes local taconite taxes in lieu of property taxes on our mines to support my region. In fact, I'm actually giving the state back almost a million dollars due to the interactions of the state's property tax refund. By providing these grants to the core iron range, we will help alleviate financial burdens for our communities and maintain essential services for the area. Plus, we continue to make the iron range a place where people wanna live, raise families, and retire with dignity and peace of mind. Like we did last year, we are using our mining production taxes to help our schools, infrastructure, community organizations, social services, and so much more. These efforts will create jobs and opportunities and enhance the uh, quality of life in our communities. With me today, I do have uh, several testifiers from the range to talk about this issue, and I'd be happy now to walk through the amendment before the testifiers. Um, Senator Housechild, please, please do. Thank you. So, Madam Chair, on the A1 amendment, lines 1.3 through 4.11, this is simply a name change to the Iron Range School Consolidation Account to the Iron Range Schools and Community Development Account, merely name changes in various sections of the mineral article. Lines 4.12 through 4.19 is a request from St. Louis County to allow their Mineral Royalties County Scholarship Fund to be used for accredited trade programs. Lines 4.20 through 5.17 are another uh, several pages of the name change to the Iron Range School account. Lines 5.18 fixes an error we found in the original bill to ensure the distribution of taconite tax proceeds to the Range Association of Municipalities and Schools is increased by a tenth of a percentage of ton. Lines 5.19 and 5.20 is another section related to the name change of the school account. Lines 5.21 and 5.22 clarified that an appropriation made by the renamed uh, school and community development account pay for the debt service related to the bonds issued in 2024. Madam Chair, the next several lines uh, are some changes to the appropriation amounts, um, but they don't, they're, they're just moving some different funds around based on community and stakeholder feedback, so I'll go through those. Lines 5.23, increases the grant amount to the Northland Learning Center by 50,000. Lines 5.24 um, doesn't change the total allocated to Chisholm, but it does allow them to use one million more in allocation for the Chisholm Ice Arena, as they requested. Line 5.25 decreases the grant amount to St. Louis County for the development of the Canyon Integrated Solid Waste Campus by 275,000. Line 5.26 reduces the grant amount to the city of Eveleth for infrastructure by 110,000. Line 5.27 increases the grant amount to the Central Range Sanitary, Sanitary Sewer District by 130,000. Line 5.28 is simply a technical change requested by the agency related to the irrigation system at the Giants Ridge state owned facility. Lines 5.29 reduces the grant amount for the mountain bike system in Northern St. Louis County by 1.15 million. 5.30 is a technical edit. And then lines 5.31 through 6.9 are some of the additional changes based on the reductions that were made previously. That includes 200,000 to the city of Babbitt, Babbitt for ADA compliance and renovations to the city's parks. 75 million increase to the Vermilion Penguin Snowmobile Club and 75,000 to the Cook Timberwolves Snowmobile, Snowmobile Club because they were left out of last year's bill and that was a request from Representative Scraba, my representative in Northern Minnesota. 500,000 to the Arrowhead Economic Opportunity Agency to design, engineer, acquire land and construction uh, for a new facility in Hibbing to meet the needs of the population on the west end of the Masabi, uh, Masabi Range. And then lastly, 500,000 to Lone Pine Township to design and construct a sewage treatment plan uh, there in Itasca County. Um, I'll try to go a little bit quicker here. So line 6.10 is technical. 
line 6.11 uh, increases the total bond amount for bonds issued in 2025 by 50,000. Lines 6.12 and 6.13 just are related to the name change again. Uh, 6.14 modifies the use of the grant amount allocated in 2025 um, for the irrigation system at Giants Ridge. Let's see here, uh, 6.15 reduces the grant amount to the Central uh, Iron Range Sanitary Sewer District again. Line 6.16 uh, is related to the Evolith change. Again, 6.17 is technical. Line 6.18 reduces the grant amount to the Hibbing Public Utilities Project. 6.19 is technical and 6.21 adds a grant amount of 1,500,000 to the city of Babbitt for renovations to their ice arena. And that is the full amendment, Madam Chair. I'd also be happy to run through the bill, the underlying bill. Um, why don't you do that um, quickly? I do, I do think we understand what the thrust of this is, but if you would do that um, generally, um, not, not listing all of the um, grants or appropriations, but just Certainly. what you're trying to achieve section by section. Certainly, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, section one of the bill as amendment amended is related to the school account name change. The section two is related to the homestead tax credit increase of 66% that I mentioned. Uh, section three is an interesting one. This is related to the um, Iron Range Fiscal Disparities Program. I want to be abundantly clear that we are not in any way, shape, or form changing the actual money that happens with that program. Rather, we're trying to make the, um, the program more transparent to our residents to show them what they're paying in or taking out based on the county and the ta uh, property tax base that they have in their local region. Um, section four is also related to the fiscal disparities program that I just described. Section five and six are related to that school account change. Section seven is related to last year's bill and it simply is a clarification that the gross proceeds tax uh, with the first 10% allocation would only come from a mine in the Taconite assistance area rather than a newly designated area of the Taconite assistance area. Uh, Madam Chair, Section 8 says occupation taxes, but I can assure you we're not taking anything from that. It's just simply a conforming for the school account. Section nine is related to a change uh, that St. Louis County requested uh, that I mentioned earlier about uh, allowing their scholarship program to be used for a trades program. Uh, section 10 is the renaming of the school account. Section 11 is that increase to the RAMs that I mentioned earlier in the amendment. Section 12 is talking about uh, the funds for these bond proceeds that would come from the remainder and the escalator that go into the Doug Johnson Fund, the Environmental Fund, and the newly named School Account and Community Development uh, Fund. Madam Chair, Section 13 is an increase of $10,000 per year to the Brighting Township using Taconite Municipal Aid because of a situation that they face with the Sudan State Park reducing their property tax base and impacting the proceeds they were getting from that program. Section 14 um, allows the Doug Johnson Fund to back up the um, bond proceeds uh, should they need to. Section 15 is the bond proceeds for 2024. Section 16 is the bond proceeds of 31 million in 2025. Excuse me, previously in 2024, it's 49 million. And lastly, Section 17 is a one-time transfer of 300,000 from the Taconite Economic Development Fund to the City of Chisholm for the Senator David Thomasoni Bridge of Peace. Madam Chair, that is the summary of the bill. I'm more than happy to take questions uh, unless you would like to move to testimony first. <clears throat> are there questions first? We can have comments later, but are there questions first? I have one with regard to um, their clarification under Section 7. Um, are there, would there be any who um, consider that a, uh, a controversial clarification, or, or is it uh, just a technical understanding of what the practice is? 
Madam Chair, uh, members, what this does, we have uh, several proposed mining projects in northern Minnesota. Two of them are in my district. One of them is uh, in another district. I believe, I think it might be Senator Rarick. What this does is it ensures that the funding formula that we created for the first 10% of the gross proceeds from any one of those projects um, goes to specific communities that have been waiting for those projects. The long story short is that it only applies uh, to a project that would actually be in those communities impacted by that funding formula rather than taking from somewhere else and sending it to another area. So uh, I'll just be more specific. It specifically is targeted at the new range mining project because that's close to Hoyt Lakes, Babbitt, and Ely, whereas Talon is in is more south, and we didn't want that project to send money outside of that area to this funding formula. What kind of mining are these new mining um, proposing to do? Madam Chair, the three projects I'm referring to are copper nickel mines. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> okay, we'll hear from your testifiers, and then we will... Um, and then we will um, open it up to the committee for comment and questions. And the first one is um, uh, Ann Oki, um, Superintendent of Ely Public Schools. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the Senate Tax Committee, my name is Ann Elke, and I am the Superintendent of the Ely Public School District. I'm here today to express my appreciation to Senator Housechild for including funding for the Ely Schools and the Northland Learning Center and Alternative Learning Center in Senate File 5435. Specific to Ely, this grant will help us complete our long planned facilities upgrade on our 100 year old campus, which is home to the Washington Elementary School and the uh, Ely Memorial High School. As for the Northland Learning Center and Alternative Learning Center facility, Ely is one of the member school districts to the Special Education Cooperative, and we appreciate the legislature considering this funding for facilities that serve our most challenged and vulnerable students. <coughs> These funds have done so much to improve educational facilities in the TACnet relief area in northern eastern Minnesota, benefiting thousands of students on the Iron Range, including Ely. Last year, the legislature took similar steps in the tax bill, allowing the Department of Iron Range Resources Commissioner to bond for individual school projects on the Iron Range. A similar pass grant has helped us move forward with renovations of our 100-year-old campus in Ely, resulting in new learning spaces, improved HVAC systems, and up-to-date vocational training spaces. Most importantly for our parents and for our kids, our new school space has a modern secured entrance which will protect our students and staff for years to come. We will now hopefully move forward with completing renovations and upgrades to our track, football and baseball fields, gymnasium, and ice arena, which are all important for youth sports and are also valuable teaching and learning spaces. Finally, unrelated to the school, as a property owner and taxpayer in northeastern Minnesota, I appreciate the increase in the tax, Taconite tax relief rebate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Lana Freilich, the city administrator for the city of Silver Bay. Welcome to the committee. Good morning, and thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Hostile, and members of the committee. Um, the city of Silver Bay strongly supports this and bill for two. Excuse me, you need to identify yourself for the record. I'm sorry, I'm Lana Freelich, the city administrator of Silver Bay. Thank, thank you. you. Um, for two key reasons, we support this bill. First, um, it supports investing in our citywide uh, community road and infrastructure improvement project. It's a large project. It's over $58 million. Um, this project does, or this fund will help us um, aid in that infrastructure. Um, there's kind of what makes Silver Bay unique in regards to when you're looking at roads and infrastructure across the state. Silver Bay um, was built all at the same time by reserve mining. Um, we are trying to work on a new quick phasing plan. Like, um, So everything was done at one time, so everything is going out at one time. So we're in kind of a difficult need to replace all of our infrastructure at the same time. We also have historic significance. Um, our entire city has been previously determined to be eligible as a historic district uh, due to the planned development of a company town by Reserve Mining Company. 
and the historic <laughs> environmental case against Reserve Mining co uh, Company, which ultimately led to its bankruptcy and closure. Um, we are trying to preserve the character of our community um, with that historic um, importance. We also do not have the financial ability. We t are just simply too small of a community. And the, the fact is, is a mile of roadway is a mile of roadway. No matter where you place it, if it's in Minneapolis, Detroit, Lakes, Duluth, Silver Bay does not have the capacity to pay for that same mile of roadway. And so we are looking for some additional you know, funding to help us aid in that um, project. So it's a big project. Um, all of it would be reconstruction of our roads and infrastructure. and. Um, for our future, it's all aged at the same time. The second reason we support this bill is um, is because of the proposed tax night property tax credit. Um, also, we support that as a homeowner, but also um, we have a very aging population on very fixed incomes, um, and so we are seeing the uh, the as values go up and they're losing the credit, it's really impacting our elderly community. So um, in closing, I guess what we see with this bill, there's no better way to reinvest. Uh, those taconite dollars back into a taconite community like Silver Bay, who has mining operations of Cleveland Cliffs North Shore Mining, and um, supporting um, our community. So we appreciate your consideration, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, next, we had um, uh, Kenny Forsman on Zoom, but we understand he is having uh, difficulty um, using the Zoom. I wonder if he is available just um, on the audio. We don't have him at all. Hmm? We don't have him at all. He's not on at all. Oh, I understand that he wasn't able to access it at, at all, Senator um, Houseman. So we'll move on to John Johnson, the commissioner um, for Itasca County. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Chair Reston, members of the committee, my name is John Johnson, and I serve as Itasca County Commissioner for District 3 in the southeast area of Itasca County. I'm also the chairman of the Itasca County Board. While I appreciate Senator Hoschild's leadership for our region and for Itasca County, I have some concerns about the approach taken with, with Senate File 5435. To respect the committee's time, I will briefly summarize my top concerns. First, the appropriation bonds authorized for the named projects in this bill work around an existing structure of the IRRRB commissioner and board. I fear that this structure could take discretion, not, could take discretion over how to su best support the economic development in the region out of the hands of the agency and create a precedent that encourages future investments to come through the legislature rather than the IRRRB's own internal structure. Second, we're still working to understand the potential impact of the spending in this bill, but our main concern is that the combination of the debt service payments and the resources necessary to provide elevated homestead reductions relies on assumptions of market stability. If those assumptions don't prove true, we're wary that the resources available to the IRRRB in the future could be eroded. Third, the investments in the bill are said to focus on the Taconite Relief Area, or TRA. Portions of the TRA are left out. If a package like this is going to, to move forward, we think that work should be done to ensure that investments are better balanced throughout the TRA. I'm happy to stand for questions, and again, I would like to restate my appreciation of Senator Hoschild's leadership, and he has been very generous with his time and willing to engage in thoughtful conversations about this bill over the last couple of days. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for your consideration. Thank you, um, Commissioner. Um, <clears throat> the next testifier is the mayor of the city of Hibbing. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, if you would identify yourself for the record. Good morning. I'm Pete Haidu, <clears throat> excuse me, Mayor of Hibbing. Uh, thank you, Chair Rest and Senator Hoschild, for the opportunity uh, to testify in this bill today. 
I'm down here because I do have a passion for my community, our Iron Range region, and this great state of Minnesota. I also understand the importance that Hibbing carries in this bill. Uh, we're a city that has two taconite plants on our footprint. We produce 31% of the taconite tonnage, which translates to $37 million annually that goes into this fund. So it, it's, it's a big stake for our region. I know we, we are a community that has produced and helped many communities throughout our region, as some of the other <coughs> uh, communities have also. But that's why it really matters to me to be here today. This week, I had an opportunity to have great conversations with Senator Hostile, the bill author, and represent, Representative Dave Lizelgard. It gave me an opportunity to express my concerns and have open communications in this process moving forward. And this time, I look forward to continuing these communications as this bill moves forward. I also had a conversation this week with mayors from Virginia and Nashwalk and talked about concerns, found common ground, and that we, we want our communities to both survive and to thrive. And this happens when we all work together, we communicate for the needs of our region. Our motto on the Iron Range for Rams is one range, one voice, and that's what I believe in. In closing, I'd like to thank you again for this opportunity to testify today, and the city of Hibbing stands ready to work with our legislators to move our region, the state of Minnesota, and the city of Hibbing forward. At this time, if you have any questions, I'll certainly answer them. Thank you, Mayor Hyduk. Um, I think we are done with the testimony, and we will now turn to um, uh, comments and questions from the, uh, the members. We're, we're going to start with Senator Dreskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I actually have questions for the commissioner and the mayor, if they're still available. Oh, of course. Um, gentlemen, if you could return. Can I get these guys some exercise today? <laughs> <laughs> Senator uh, Dreskowski, and then we'll go to Senator Wood. Thank Senator you. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Commissioner and, and Mayor. Um, it, it's, it speaks volumes for you to drive down here and, um, and, and burn up an entire day to come and testify on a bill, and your passions are very clear in your testimony. I've been in the legislature for 17 years now, and I know, and I'm from southern Minnesota, so I'm, and I've been involved in kind of the, the, the tax group um, the entire, almost the entire time, and have watched and from afar um, and sometimes up closer um, of what's happened with this, this taconite money in the iron range and kind of the fights that have gone forward and, and we really in a period now where I've just reflected over the last, you know, several years since probably the mid-teens uh, the water has been calm in northern Minnesota around uh, the IRRRB. There was a point where there was some, um, some problems that happened there. Um, there was some corruption and other things that uh, were alleged. I don't remember all the details, but uh, there, the, it was problematic for a while, and now it seems that things are good. Uh, it seems that uh, at least there's not any controversy going forward. My question for you, for you guys is, um, how is the process working there now with IRRRB? Um, is, are, are you confident in what they're doing? Because obviously this bill is coming forward to replace or displace what they're doing and take away, essentially take away their authority and uh, in, in the form of a bill that the legislature would, would bring forward and make the decisions instead. So I'm curious, if you could reflect on that. We'll begin with uh, the mayor. Yes, uh, Madam Chair. You know, I, I'm, I know the IRRRB has a fantastic staff right now, and they have a great leader in Ida Rukavina. And, and uh, this is a change. There's no doubt about it. And, uh, but I still think there, there's ways that they can move forward and, and still vet these projects, which I think is important. Uh, all the projects are on the range. Uh, there's still enough funding, excuse me, there's still enough funding within the agency for other economic development projects, housing projects, uh, whatever is in the divisions, the way it is multiplied out, that those projects will still be vetted. 
I have confidence in the communities that are represented here that they will vet these projects internally. I know as a city of Hibbing, we would. And, and I feel the same thing about any other community leaders within our region. Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Draskowski. I, again, as I stated earlier, I greatly appreciate Senator Hoschild's leadership and his advocacy for, for, for the advancement of the, of the entire Iron Range in the Taconite Relief Area. My primary concern is something that you just alluded to, Senator, and that is uh, we have a very successful and established team and a commissioner uh, who's a great leader that, that leads the IRRR in establishing and vetting potential projects all throughout the Taconite Relief Area and the Taconite Assistance Area. So my concern and reason for being here today is I fear that if we do set a precedent where the legislature gets involved in how that happens in direct, um, directed funding and in directed grants, that it might possibly erode that success or potentially cause other issues that couldn't be anticipated. Thank you both. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Draskowski. Um, Senator Weber. And then said, oh. Hmm? Okay, I had, I had Senator Weber next, but Senator Nelson. Okay. Thank you, thank you. I'm um, just one uh, kind of like housekeeping thing, and then I, I do have a couple uh, questions and comments, but um, I have been trying to find uh, sections 12 through 17 that our bill summary speaks of, and that, but it's not in the, the, the bill ends at section 11, and even with the A1 amendment, there are no sections 12 through 17, so I'm just wondering if there's a new, uh, if we have all the information, or, or maybe I'm just missing the, uh, the missing sections. Senator, uh, not Senator, um, <clears throat> Mr. Silvio. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Nelson and members, so uh, the, the A1 amendment had the effect of, of adding several sections to the bill. Okay. Um, so, so all of the, the sections that are referenced in the summary um, you know, are, are contained either within the bill or the amendment. The, the summary is written as if the amendment were adopted, but um, the first almost five sections of the A1 amendment are the new sections, which has the result of sort of kicking all the others down. Thank you. Very, that, Madam Chair, I, now my real question. Okay, go right ahead. I just Senator couldn't Nelson. get beyond the missing language. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I just have a, a couple um, questions, broader questions. So the um, first one has to do with um, accountability to the, um, to the, uh, to, to the residents in, the, in this area. And I guess what I'm wondering is, if I understand correctly, and Senator Hoschild, you can elaborate on this, but we're looking at, um, as, we, as we look at the um, taconite um, assistance, or the production tax, it's uh, paid in lieu of property taxes. Big mines, lots of land, I understand that. Okay, so it's in lieu of property taxes. But um, property taxes, Normally, in, in other areas that aren't in the IRRRB, uh, they pay for cities, counties, school districts. All who have elected, um, the voters elect those members of the school board, the city, uh, and, and the school, and the counties who determine the funding. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a direct route between who makes the decisions on how the property taxes, or the, in this case, the in lieu of property taxes, production tax dollars, are spent. And the voters determine if they like how they're being spent or not, and there's always an election down the road. My question is, with the IRRRB, um, th there is these, uh, this money uh, is spent, is determined, the IRRRB typically, as I understand, determines how the so-called property tax money, but it's really in lieu of property taxes, production tax, is spent. Are the IRRRB members accountable to the public? In other words, if the public doesn't think that this money is being spent the, the way that it should be, it's really property tax money, but do they, have a, do they elect those IRRRB members? 
Senator Hounschild. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Nelson. You're, you're bringing up some interesting points and I might try to provide some context. So yes, the IRRB board is made up of state legislators that make up what is called the Iron Range delegation unofficially. Um, so that includes members that have a certain percentage of mining within their legislative district. Um, however, there was a report that was done, and I don't know the year because I wasn't here, um, but a report was done that basically said in years past, the IRRB board uh, was on, on that board up, uh, approving projects directly. Um, and there was a determination that that was not appropriate, that it should be the broader legislature, if they're doing appropriation, should decide those decisions. So since that decision, uh, a Republican appointed uh, IRRB commissioner recommended that that board become advisory. So in the current state of the IRRB, the, the legislative members of the board are simply advisory to the commissioner saying, yeah, we think that's a cool idea. We think that's a good idea. Uh, but in no way, shape, or form are they actually deciding whether or not what the commissioner and the staff come up with uh, are actually approved. I just want to provide one last piece of context. What you're bringing up about accountability and how people feel about their local property taxes being utilized, that's actually kind of one of the reasons I brought this bill forward. Because there is some sentiment among community members on the Iron Range who live in communities where mining is happening that the process by which the IRRB is distributing those monies are going outside of the Taconite relief area to communities where perhaps mining is not as prevalent. Uh, and so what this bill really, in my opinion, uh, is focused on is really supporting core infrastructure and quality of life issues uh, predominantly in areas where that is happening. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair and uh, Senator Hochschild. So th there, I think you've pointed out that there is a issue maybe in that the public who is in a sense, maybe they don't have that ability to, do, to determine how their in lieu of property tax dollars are being spent uh, be, by, because they don't elect the IRRB members who don't make that decision anymore you said. So who is making the decision now? If the IRRB is not making these decisions about where the um, production tax or prop in lieu of property tax, where the, how those property tax dollars are being spent, who's making the decision today? Senator Hellstrom. Madam Chair, Senator Nelson. I just, so first, the, the, the board is elected, they're all legislators. So I just wanna make sure that that's clear, they are elected. And while being advisory, I mean, in a sense, they are politically accountable to the people regardless. Now, to your, to your more specific question, the, right now the process is that the IRRB staff uh, have go through a process for determining um, ideas for projects that should be funded, applications are made, and then ultimately the IRRB commissioner brings forth her, uh, her report to each meeting saying here's the uh, places that we are determining should get grants and, and various appropriations. One, one follow up, Madam Chair. Senator Nelson. Thank you. So then, if I understand correctly, the uh, commissioner who is not elected, um, the commissioner of the IRRB determines how the property tax dollars, now called production tax, is spent. So it's the commissioner of the IRRB who makes that decision. Thank you. Chair Senator uh, Nelson. Rest, Senator Nelson, yes, or the legislature does. Madam Chair, just follow up. Let Senator Let's get to the end here. Uh, so then the commissioner makes that decision on how the property tax dollars or production tax dollars are being spent for cities, counties, and school districts, but he or she does so with the report from the IRRB, which is advisory. And then is that advisory board, if that's correct, is that correct that advisory board advises the commissioner? Yeah, on how um, to Madam also, Chair, Senator, Senator Nelson. Nelson, yes, the, 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 so when the meeting is called, she brings forth a breakdown of what all is being appropriated and the board votes 
whether or not they approve. However, that vote determined, like I said previously, by a change at the legislature is no longer a direct approval. It's an advisory vote. Okay. So last question, Madam Chair. Chair no, Just sir. to understand the, the flow here of who makes the decisions and the accountability. So it's the um, commissioner, but there is the report from the legislators of the IRRB who make these recommendations. So we're all of, and how many legislators are there, seven? Senator Halstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Nelson, I'm doing, I'm doing a little count here. We just had our ranger party last night. Um, I believe it's seven. There. <laughs> I, well, it's I seven plus, um, <laughs> we do have one majority leader appointee on the board, and that is Senator Champion. So um, I, I'm just trying to do my quick math. I think it's maybe eight, but I'll try to count right now. So, Madam Chair, my final Nelson. question. You've been very patient, thank you. So what I want to know then, whether it's seven or eight, however many it is that make the recommendations that the commissioner says this is how this prop these property tax dollars should be spent, um, or in lieu of, I mean, um, were all of those seven or eight members of the, uh, who are supposed to make these decisions, are they all, uh, auth I only see one authorship on here. There must be some other senators. Uh, are all of those senators recommending this? Um, Senator Halstrom? Chair Rest, Senator Nelson, uh, no, they're, they're not. This is a bill that I'm presenting as an idea that I think is the best way to appropriate the funding. Okay, oh, I guess the last question then. So, oh, sorry, Madam Chair. Senator Nelson. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so then, um, I think, it, but the legislature now is to make these decisions, mm -hmm. but I would just say it's difficult if uh, there's just one entity represented here. So maybe there's bills from other uh, IRRB members coming, and I'll just leave my comments with saying I'm still concerned, though, that it doesn't look to me like the uh, residents uh, who live in this area actually have a very clear pipeline to saying we don't like how this money is spent or we we do and we'd ra or we'd rather see someone else in these positions this is my final comments thank you madam chair if i might oh. just it, um, sorry um, is it the case or how frequently is the case when um, a proposal has been brought by the commissioner has the uh, delegation not supported the recommendation and uh, in turn then was the recommendation from the commissioner um, abandoned for something that the, um, the uh, full board, the legislative delegation uh, then was more satisfied with? Madam Chair, I, um, I, I don't want to say incorrect information. I am not aware of a time that okay. that has happened. However, uh, there have been many instances in, in recent memory where we have been divided. Uh, okay. So there might be four votes for, three votes against, something like that. Okay. Um, so to, can I uh, answer sure. maybe just very briefly, Senator, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Nelson. Um, so this... Um, I, I, I hear what you're saying regarding the, the delegation um, and those concerns. I do want to assure you that this bill uh, should have bipartisan support uh, from some of the Iron Range uh, delegation. Um, and we have consulted uh, with several of the members about uh, what projects and needs that they had in their communities. Um, and we are continuing those conversations as well. Thank you, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. I noticed that within this bill, there are substantial transfers out of the Douglas J. Johnson Trust Fund. Um, Senator Hauschild, could you explain to us why that trust fund was established? Senator Hauschild. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Weber. The Doug Johnson Fund was meant to help uh, in reinvest the taconite proceeds back into the Iron Range uh, in order to help stimulate economic activity, create jobs, as well as diversify our regional economy. And I noticed, Senator Chair, Weber, um, that Senator Weber, you need to go through the chair. Yes, <laughs> you're very good, Madam Chair. Um, 
There are the annual appropriation for or payment to the, the trust is mm -hmm. being designated in a different um, amount of ways. And then there, the balance, whatever is left, is being transferred back into the uh, IRRRB itself. Are the transfers of those funds guaranteed to provide the same purpose for which the trust was established in the first place? Senator Halstrom. <coughs> Madam <coughs> Chair, uh, Senator Weber. So the, actually in the, in the current bill, just to kind of clarify what's happening here, the way the, the funding formula goes for these taconite production tax proceeds is they go through this whole formula for going to the IRRRB to various funding needs. And what has traditionally happened is that there is this remainder or what might be referred to as a surplus. Um, as well as an inflator that's automatically adjusted to increase that production tax. Um, the Doug Johnson Fund has traditionally been a, um, a holding fund for those funds, but they're often distributed to other funds like the school consolidation account in 2013 or the environmental trust fund uh, that is used by the IRRRB for various projects. Um, and there have been previous mineral articles that have tapped into that remainder or that surplus um, in order to do appropriated projects directly from the legislature. Sure. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. I noticed in the uh, bill that there is an increase of a tenth of a cent uh, to the uh, Range Association of Municipalities and Schools. Uh, so who made the determination that that tenth of a percent was necessary? Senator Halstrom. Um, Chair Ress, Senator Weber, um, I, I did, so it's, it's my bill, I, I made that determination. Um, however, I do just want to clarify that we're not increasing any taconite taxes, we're simply shifting that remainder uh, and increasing it by a tenth of a percentage ton to that Understood. particular organization. Madam Chair. Senator Weber. Understood, uh, Senator. Um, but. Uh, one of the things I want to mention is that many of these projects in here would typically, not all, but typically qualify for the state bonding projects, uh, as state bonding projects. Um, you know, with them being financed in this manner, uh, why should a future bonding chair consider bonding projects out of these communities? Senator Halstrom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Weber, you know, from my perspective, many of our communities, many of our regions across Minnesota have various economic advantages. Um, I think of places like Rochester with Mayo and the sales tax they can produce by all of the visiting citizens that come there. I think about places like Bloomington that has tremendous property tax base as well as the sales tax that they're able to collect for local projects. I think about the wealth that is enormous in places like Edina and other wealthy communities. Um, we all have various industries and advantages. Um, and what happens in those local communities is they take their property tax base or their sales tax and they use it to fund various projects. Uh, simply what I'm doing here is using the advantages of the economy on the Iron Range to reinvest back in our people, to reinvest back in our communities, and do exactly what any other community would do with the assets that they have at their disposal. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, looking at an approximately $80 million bonding uh, project within this bill, uh, and it to be, which is to be paid for, obviously, by the uh, taconite production tax. Um, over the course of history, we've seen problems in the steel industry, and we've seen, unfortunately, these mines having to close down for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so if that happens, how will these bonds be paid for? <clears throat> Senator Hellstrom. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Weber, great question. Um, and so there's a couple of different dynamics. Number one, uh, rightfully so, previous Iron Range legislators have created a sort of stabilization process on the range to ensure that when a mine closes, there's a three-year running average for what the taconite production tax is. So if, for instance, what happened two years ago with the North Shore mine closing, it had very little impact on the taconite production taxes despite that mine being closed for over a year because there's that three year average that happened. So, so that's the, the first thing. The second thing is that this bill has a very, very conservative estimate for the tonnage production of, of taconite. Uh, right now we're at 35 million tons. This bill assumes 32 million. 
So should there be any closures or any reductions in processing uh, or mining, this bill is kind of accounting for possibilities for that to occur. Uh, the third, uh, and I think most important aspect of this, is that the bill is backed up by the Doug J. Johnson Fund that we just referred to earlier. Uh, I want to be be sure that all the members know this, the Doug Johnson Fund has $216 million in it. So the bond proceeds that are approximately $3 million a year in payments uh, are, are not a concern for ensuring we have the funds we need to pay these bonds should we have any dramatic changes on the range. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, actually, you know, you, you talk about uh, Senator Housechild being a conservative estimate of 32 million as opposed to 35. Uh, that's a little under 10 percent. I, I'm, I guess I'm not sure I would call that conservative, but um, I look at uh, the concerns that have been raised by some of the range members that are here today and that are included in letters in our packet. And uh, I remember a few years ago when I first got on the tax committee, a a long-standing member and I were talking about uh, other bills, and and this person said to me, "Well, when it comes to comes to the IRRRB, uh, you know, sometimes they come to us with a recommendation of spending that sort of pushes the boundaries a little bit of what we typically do as a state. But at the end of the day, it's their money. We let them do what they want." The problem I see with this bill, Senator Housechild, is that this is not an IRRRB recommendation. This bill circumvents the entire process. It gives them no say in vetting the projects or in recommending the projects. Mm -hmm. And at this point, quite frankly, it leads to a question, why do we have the IRRRB? <coughs> Senator? Mm -hmm. Senator Housechild. Thank you, Madam Chair and um, Senator Weber. There have been approximately 30 to 40 mineral articles over the decades by Iron Range legislators, and it's often been, as you've probably seen firsthand, a little bit of a pull and tug on, on what, what that looks like. In addition to my earlier remarks, uh, in the past it has been amendments in conference committee, which is less uh, in the public than this process is. Um, I, I can assure you that the, the IRRRB has a good process. Um, I think it is really important that that agency be available for critical investments that we might need, might need to make to potential industry projects, to diversifying our economy, to making investments in infrastructure, those types of things. Uh, however, it has been the prerogative of the Iron Range delegation and whoever is in power uh, to introduce a mineral article that appropriates directly uh, utilizing taconite production taxes separate from the IRRRB. Uh, so this is not, um, you know, a, a new thing. This is something that Iron Range delegation members have done for, for many decades. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would say that you are wrong on one point, Senator Hauschild. Typically, when we've seen proposals come before us and, and that have come before the legislature in the past, uh, there's been an agreement amongst the legislative representatives of the Iron Range um, as to contact with the other members. Uh, quite frankly, most of the rest of them were surprised when this bill showed up. Uh, any discussion to them about projects had been pretty much in passing and never had an indication of the scope of this project been explained to them or offered to them. Um, and I think that, as I mentioned earlier, history has always allowed issues resolved by the IRRRB and its members and communities uh, to be honored. Um, and Unfortunately, this time, it seems that there's been a plan developed by only a couple members of the IRRRB delegation, or the range delegation, and there's been no communication with the member cities at large. There's been no opportunity for the IRRRB to be here and actually offer their recommendation regarding this project because I certainly haven't seen anything from them as an organization. 
And quite frankly, with the monies being taken out of the trust, regardless of what the corpus remains, uh, we have seen $250 million disappear very quickly. I mean, really, Madam Chair, we saw a $19 billion surplus disappear in this state last year. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the day, how do you justify, Senator Hochschild, for circumventing a process that before, quite frankly, has worked, that has kept the range members together, and, um, and has not led to the disagreements that I see arising here. Senator Hellstrom. Thank you, Chair Rest, uh, Senator Weber. You know, I think when I, when I hear um, concerns that you have described, and looking back at how the Iron Range delegation has operated, I, I think we may have a Pollyannish view of, of, of the Iron Range delegation. Um, if you talk to anybody who uh, lives on the range and knows the history of the delegation, um, things were not always agreeable. In fact, uh, things uh, probably got quite nasty between the different members of where different mineral articles were appropriating money, and I've, I know several stories. Um, and so this idea that everybody was in agreement and it was a kumbaya, I don't think uh, is probably historically accurate. Um, I would say what, what we're doing here is presenting a proposal. Uh, I'm on the tax committee. The representative in the House who is presenting a similar bill is on the tax committee. We're the only members of the Iron Range delegation that sit on the tax committee. Um, and we are presenting a mineral article just like our forefathers have on the Iron Range delegation. And we are certainly open to many conversations with our other delegation members to talk about projects, issues, concerns. Um, you know, I'm getting a third of the appropriations in this bill. Senator Farnsworth is getting, for example, two thirds. Um, that's a substantial uh, uh, difference in the, in the appropriations. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a fair model. It's targeting it to the Taconite relief area. And we'll continue having conversations like the mayor and the commissioner mentioned about how we might be able to do better. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, uh, I guess at this point, uh, I would just simply say that the way that this bill has come forward, it seems to be to be more of a re-election bill than a bill for the benefit of the communities included in the Iron Range. And, and I don't think, quite frankly, that that, uh, there may have been disagreements between the members of the range, but they at least sat down ahead of time and made an effort to work them out, which is another process, Senator Hochschild, I think you have blatantly um, forgotten about in this whole process. And so with that, Madam Chair, I think I'm done. Um, but I'm not. And I do want to, even though we do not have a, um, um, a rule um, in, in this committee that um, uh, chastises members for uh, questioning the motives of another member, um, I would like to remind us um, when we get heated about our, um, uh, our opinions about legislation that has come forward from another member that we um, remind ourselves of that. Um, Senator uh, Juskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm curious, is the, the RRRB approach that they're using for these funds now I mean, there's a huge borrow and spend component to this bill. Is is bonding used to, uh, do they borrow and then pay it off uh, from the, the corpus or are they spending direct cash and how they're operating now? Senator Hellshaw. Madam Chair, Senator Dreskowski, there's different, I think both is the answer to your question. Um, you know, I can look at years that the IRRB has used revenue bonds for projects, 1985 uh, for the infamous chopsticks production facility in Hibbing, uh, 1991 for the LP mill in Two Harbors, um, 1996 and 2000 for Giants Ridge, the state-owned ski resort, and then 2006, 2013, and last year for school bonding projects. 
Um, and so there have been several instances where revenue bonds have been used, but then there's also the direct appropriations from the corpus of the Doug Johnson Fund or just the base budget of the IRRB ranging from 50 to $60 million that they appropriate each year via their budget. Senator, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hoshield. Um, you know, I, I, I struggle with this bill on, on several accounts. Um, one of them is that we have a process that's working on the iron range. We've got to hit, we, if you go back, as I mentioned in history, there was a lot of problems up there. And the people on the iron range, from what I can see, have been working together very well over the last several years. This IRRB approach seems to be working. It seems to provide a very robust uh, opportunity for the member communities, for everyone to be heard. Uh, their input is solicited. Senator Hoschild, you just said earlier, this is this is what I think it should be. And, you know, I, I don't know. I, that's, and Madam Chair, I don't want to run over the guidelines, but that strikes me as an arrogant type of statement and approach to this. When you have an inclusive process going on now and just for one or in this case two legislators, you and Representative Listelgard, to come in and say, no, we know better than what is happening in the Iron Range now. That's what I am hearing here today. And we've got a huge borrowing component to this to make it a huge bill to make it a Christmas tree. And it appears that you and Representative Lissagard want to be Santa Claus. We shouldn't have a bill before us that does that and displaces something that's working. Because as, as Senator Weber said, this is going to obviously cause division in the legislature that isn't here right now. And I, I, I've heard from some of the communities that communities are already divided over this bill. Again, it, it just kind of came before us here, and I don't know how many communities in your district and Senator Farnsworth district have or haven't heard from you. I can't imagine you've been as busy here as I, or you're in the majority. You may be even busier here than I with bills. I can't imagine how you have gone out to each of the communities to take the level of input that the IRRB process would do. And I, I, I'm certain it hasn't happened. And we can't uproot what is being successful in favor of something that one member believes is better, a better outcome than what the community is ha having happen <coughs> now. So. Um, I, I don't know where this bill goes, Madam Chair, but um, I, I, think, I think it's a mistake to head in this direction. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Senator um, House Child, we've had a very thorough discussion. We still have another bill to get to, so um, <clears throat> uh, without objection, I'm going to lay over. Um, Senator Brown. Um, 5435 as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rep. Thank you. Yep. Welcome to the committee, Senator Ress. Senate file 5347 is in front of the committee. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, and members. Um, Senate File 5347 is a bill that continues a um, tradition of the um, <clears throat> Tax Committee um, to um, conduct uh, outreach and to give uh, grants to the various uh, uh, volunteer and not-for-profit um, organizations around the state to help um, <clears throat> uh, Minnesota income taxpayers uh, with filing their tax returns. Um, this bill uh, uh, continues that tradition and it's particularly important this year um, and moving forward um, uh, as more and more Minnesota families discover their eligibility for the Minnesota Child Tax Credit. Um, so this is this bill is a um, an appropriation to um, uh, to the um, uh, for that for that effort, and the policy is is continued. Um, and in section, uh, in section to direct your attention to that, um, with regard to appropriations that are made by the tax committee, this is this is um, a considerable one. Uh, in the lines 2.23, one million dollars is appropriated from the general fund to the um, to the uh, commissioner of revenue for tax credit outreach grants, and um, it, uh, <clears throat> it also includes a $750,000 uh, appropriation for uh, fiscal year 2025 um, uh, for uh, an, another um, grant. So $1.7.5 million for this effort. Um, what is not apparent from that is just how much it means to Minnesota taxpayers in the um, uh, in the increase in the refunds um, of taxes that they have paid or that we consider to be um, uh, necessary for uh, health and welfare of families and um, uh, and economic prosperity. Um, there are a number of organizations, most most prominently Prepare and Prosper, who is here today to testify, and um, but also um, AERP has done um, done that in the past. Um, these organizations not only have uh, trained volunteers, but often. Um, professional taxpayers volunteer their time in these programs um, across across the state. Uh, Representative Gomez and I are committed to um, uh, <clears throat> uh, supporting these programs with with an appropriation um, to uh, continue their their fine their fine work. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, there are two witnesses. If uh, Alejandro Valenzuela and Alvin Alkbar are in the room, could you come forward? Mr. Valenzuela, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and go ahead. Well, good morning. I'm Alejandro Valenzuela, and thank you, Chair Rest, and um, the members of the committee. Um, I'm Alejandro Valenzuela. I'm the Tax and Financial Services Director at Prepare and Prosper. Uh, I've been in this role for about, uh, just a little, uh, close to four years now, but I've been in the VITA community, which is the uh, Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, um, for over 18 years, and actually this was my 19th tax season, <laughs> and I'm um, glad it's done with, but we do, we do our work all year round at Prepare and Prosper, so, so um, I'm... Uh, I'm here as a voice for the community um, and also in support of SF um, 5347 to increase funding to um, buy the sites and the tax out outreach across Minnesota. Um, this tax season at Prepare and Prosper, we, we were able to begin um, a more concentrated focus in uh, providing culturally appropriate programming 
um, providing services in um, other languages and like in Spanish, uh, but also we are looking to expand those services in other languages um, and opening additional Vita sites locations that, to further serve these, these communities. Um, also this year, in, you know, Prepare and Prosper established an outreach campaign to reach communities where otherwise they were unaware of all the tax or new tax um, credits that are available. Uh, so increased funding will allow for organizations like Prepare and Prosper to expand the opportunity to reach communities, to provide education about their eligibility, and file for these new tax credits. Um, information that often comes, you know, don't don't reach to these, you know, these communities that we serve. Uh, by supporting SF um, 5347, we'll help buy the sites throughout the state and provide need, needed tax credits um, to Minnesotans. Um, thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Valenzuela. Mr. Akabar, please introduce yourself. Uh, good morning, committee. Thank you, Chair Rest, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Dr. Alvin Akabar. I am a social and health psychologist, and I am the Systems Change Director at Prepare and Prosper. Uh, so in our work to understand the needs of community health, uh, what the, one thing becomes very clear, financial health is the cornerstone by which all other facets of health are determined. Um, it lays the found work for folks to meet their basic needs, provides the uh, short resource by which they survive hardship, which as we were probably all too familiar, things can come at you fast. Um, and it really is something that currently is out of reach for most Minnesotans, given current costs of living outpaces the majority of Minnesotan households uh, to meet basic minimum standards of financial health. Uh, so Prepare and Prosper and other Vita sites work in tandem with uh, uh, government efforts to promote financial health. Uh, we make these services approachable. We make sure that folks are able to receive the tax credits um, and stabilizing tax refunds that are due to them. Um, and so as a result, we really do try our best to make these services uh, accessible. Um, we make them easier to understand. We try to make sure that we reach folks regardless of barriers posed by income or background. Um, and so as a result, the reality is that even with Prepare and Prosper as the largest VITA site in the state of Minnesota, and alongside more than 170 other VITA sites throughout the state, um, quite frankly, capacity is far outpaced by demand. Um, so really, uh, this funding would allow us to innovate, to expand our services, to restore services uh, that were lost over the course of the last several years through, through the COVID pandemic and just economic uh, spiral, um, and really ensuring that folks have access to what is due to them. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Members of the committee. Senator Rest. Uh, Senate file 5347 will be laid over. And may adjourn the committee. The committee is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Sitting through all